Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. I have not done one of these, you know, sort of stream of consciousness videos in a while, but uh, someone added me and suggested that I read this thread. And their TLDR was basically, the right has already lost the culture war. Uh, and anyone who stands up to the sort of new postmodern left will instantly get smashed down because it uh, it replicates itself. It already has uh, control over all the institutions and all the power. So no, you know, leftist can stand up and say, I object to cancel culture without instantly having cancel culture come crashing down on them. And this has kind of been occasioned by a group of, you know, blue checkmark journalists coming out and saying, we as, you know, liberals who hate Trump, we are tired of cancel culture. And then, of course, to prove that there's no cancel culture, they immediately start getting canceled, right? That'll, that'll show them. Uh, so uh, my friend uh, tweet, tweets this at me. Uh, this is 0HP Lovecraft, great username. Uh, I hadn't been following 0HP Lovecraft before this. I'm following him now. Uh, he has a really bad handle, 0 X 49 F A 98 is his handle. And uh, I'm thinking about this thread a lot because I think this is saying something that I've been thinking about in the arts and he's saying it in a way that I couldn't say it. So uh, I am not like deeply read on the postmodernists. I, I talk about him a lot, but I have mostly like a pretty superficial knowledge of the postmodernists because I encountered them through my reading about the thing I actually love, which is art. So I would be reading about art, I read about postmodern art, and I'd say, wow, this postmodern art is weird. I want to I want to know more about this postmodern art. So then I'd read a little Foucault, I'd read a, read a little uh, Derrida, but it's I have a very, like, uh, I don't know, like surface level understanding of the, po the postmodernists. Uh, where to kind of like Maybe like my dumb two sentence summary of Foucault would be is he's very interested in power dynamics and uh, the identity is basically shaped by the culture and you, you can't escape that. Uh, you can never be entirely independent of the powerful cultural forces that are shaping who you are in the way you think. And uh, Zero HP Lovecraft talks about this problem and how basically this is trickled down from like being a big cerebral academic dispute in the philosophy halls into, you know, every normal person's life. Like, you might not care much about this until your comic books start uh, having postmodernism in them, and then you say, wait a second, how did postmodernism get in my comic books? This is weird. So I want to talk about four artists, actually, four creative people who I think illustrate the same problem, because this is, I think about these kinds of problems through the lens of, I like art, and Lovecraft is going to be talking about this more from like a uh, like someone who actually like deeply reads the philosophy perspective. So the four artists I'm thinking about are H.P. Lovecraft, the inspiration for his username, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, George Orwell, and Aldous Huxley. And I think all four of them have written books that talk about the same problem. But artists, when they create a work of art, it's sort of like they're, they're just getting into the story. They may have like this big idea that they can't express as a dumb slogan yet. So that big idea finds expression through their art. So in J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, it's the one ring. The J.R.R. Tolkien didn't like uh, uh, allegory, but it's even though he, there isn't a simple allegory, like you can't just say uh, Lord of the Rings is about World War II, the ring is very much corrupting power. Uh, it exerts its influence over people. To defeat Sauron, we must use the, the, the power of the ring against Sauron. And it, I think it's ironic that only in Tolkien's work is there a happy ending. Only in Tolkien's work do the hobbits destroy the ring. But e even so, it's not a perfectly happy ending. The elves, the elves are doomed after the end of the war for the ring. Uh, the magical world will gradually fade away and be replaced by the world of men. The hobbits go home and they see that the the, sh the shire has been taken over by Saruman. The the hobbits, for all of their wonderful uh, traits, they're, they're a wonderful people. But they're the fact that the hobbits were ignoring the outside world made it hard for them to resist the outside world when Saruman kicked down their door and took over there. Right. So there's this tragic loss that uh, never gets repaired, even after good triumphs over evil. Frodo is forever uh, kind of like thin, uh, marred or harmed by the trauma he went through uh, f f f fighting to destroy the ring, right? But because Tolkien's a Catholic and he has this greater faith, there is sort of like this ultimate redemption in the, in the eternal world that comes hereafter. Now, 
The other three, H.P. Lovecraft, uh, George Orwell, and Aldous Huxley, have a much more pessimistic view of the same problem. The, the creepy new modern technological world is invading our world, and it's taking away everything that made life worth living for kind of like the normal little person, for the, for the hobbits of the world. Uh, in Orwell, it's obviously Oceania. It's this massive government that observes everything you do. And even if you're a free thinker, the government catches you and tortures you until your thinking becomes Big Brother's thinking. It's not even enough for them to kill you. It's not even enough for them to imprison you. They have to break you for no other reason than to break you to prove that they can do it. Uh, no, no one, no one can think freely in or Orwell's world, and uh, the only way you could have a revolution is for people to think think freely. So it's basically a perfect tyranny. It's a tyranny that once you're in it, there's no way to get out of it ever again. In Huxley's Br Br Brave New Ro World, it's a similar problem, but a di bit different. It's not a Big Brother overseeing everything. It's basically everybody oppressing everybody else. It's, a, it's, sort of, it's sort of like almost everyone in the in the world thinks the same way. So there doesn't need to be a tyrant to come in and stamp the boot on them. Everybody agrees in the same insane new world. They they teach children to be uh, to, to have sex in the brave new world because sex is perceived as just a object of pleasure. There are, uh, they infertilize people. There's no consequences of sex. They've reduced sex to just the feeling of, of pleasure. And they make sure that from your earliest ages, you're indoctrinated into thinking this way. Uh, you, you think the way they think about sex. Uh, they mar crosses. They cut the tops off of crosses and turn them into tees because they basically worship uh, Henry Ford and industrialization. They want everything to be kind of mechanic and orderly. And it's sort of like a uh, Sort of like a weird mashup of capitalism and communism in in Brave Brave New World. They have rigid uh, caste structures, but it's sort of like uh, the desire to have everybody to belong to everybody else has. It, it's sort of like it, it doesn't make sense that there would be the, this egalitarian idea and this uh, class structure idea, but it doesn't have to make sense. All that matters is they, they get everybody thinking the same way and behaving the same way. And again, there's there's no way out of it because literally everybody agrees with the, the brave new world. And if you ever feel sad, take a little pill of Soma and that placates you and makes you feel happy. Uh, the last one, H.P. Lovecraft, I think this might be the most relevant. So I sort of see H.P. H. P. Lovecraft as a atheist Tolkien. So Tolkien uh, looks to his Catholic faith, and he loves God, and so that is expressed in Lord of the Rings. H.P. Lovecraft doesn't love God, and so when he thinks of the idea of God, it's Cthulhu, and it's terrifying. It's 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 maddening. Uh, I, I hate Cthulhu memes because kind of the point of the Cthulhu character is it's supposed to be inexpressible. You can't, you can't even say the name properly in the English tongue, Cthulhu, right? There's no way to pronounce it. Uh, and in, the character in The Call of Cthulhu is this white academic uh, New England guy who is just looking forward to learning about this uh, Cthulhu cult so he can write a book about it, right? He thinks this is going to be like a really neat little uh, thesis for him to publish about the Cthulhu cult. And then to his horror, he discovers that the people he thought were savages were right and he was wrong. There is this Cthulhu, it's, it exists, and it's all-powerful and it doesn't care about human life. So it's, 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 a, it's a kind of evil that uh, drives us mad because it's it's so foreign from us. It's uh, it'd be like trying to face God and being overwhelmed by just like the the awe and power of God. But instead of that being a good thing, like in Christianity, it's this horrifying, maddening thing in H.P. Lovecraft's worlds. So I, I think all four of these creative people were anticipating sort of the slow encroachment of technology and the new world. On, on us, where the your world as an individual, your ability to influence your family, your faith, that world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Hobbiton has is uh, attack. They they just keep attacking Hobbiton until there are no more Hobbitons left, and it's all uh, it's it's all Saruman uh, Sar Saruman sorcery and uh, perversion perversion of nature. It's all uh, it's all Sauron's rigorous control of. And enslavement of, of everything, right? All, all four of them are worried about that and expressing it through these stories. So with that, let's. I, I just want to kind of like read through Zero HP Lovecraft's thread. I'll tweet this at him. And I'm basically just going to give you like my uh, not a philosopher 
uh, not a philosophy major, an art, art, an art major's uh, perspective on a philosophy problem. And I'm going to try to like con connect this to what I've been thinking about with respect to art. So writes zero HP Lovecraft. People say we are in a cold civil war. Uh, this is wrong. We lost a cold civil war because we had sticks and our enemies had guns. The best plan any of us has is to retreat to the countryside because that's what you do when you lose. Uh, I'm thinking of the book, uh, the Benedictine option. There are some people in Christian circles talking about forming monasteries basically to escape from the modern world because we see no way to, to fix the problem of we, we, we can't fix these institutions because they're corrupted at a deep level. There's no way to fix Harvard. There's no way to fix the New York Times. They're gone. Uh, by now, every white collar in America has been through a woke struggle session. When a, uh, I'm guessing, white collar, WOC, I don't know what WOC refers to. When a white collar tweets, white lives don't matter, she gets a promotion. The game we are playing does not have the rules that you think because you don't understand power. If you are a Republican or a paleocon who thinks there is some use to be salvaged from reasoned argument, appeals to the Constitution, or to fairness, or anything you learned in school about American civics, you are the reason we lost. So this reminds me of kind of like the trend. Uh, I call it the dissident right. The, uh, they're mad at uh, conservative ink. I, sh I share some. Uh, I share a lot of that frustrations. I think conservative ink has lost the culture war. They've they've abandoned the culture. They abandoned Hollywood, and they helped create the situation where the left could take over everywhere. Like I I, I blame the boomers, right? Damn, damn boomers. <laughs> but uh, it, zero HP is kind of then saying, let, 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 pay attention to what he's saying. Reason argument doesn't work. I agree, right? If someone rejects reason. You can't use reason to convince someone who hates reason that reason is good. Oop, crud. Appeals to the Constitution, right? If someone rejects the Constitution, me saying it's constitutional won't help them come to agree with me. Fairness, right? Right. If I say that's unfair, you're treating the white person unfairly. Would if you tr treated a black person that way, you'd see it, it. It's wrong. They don't care. They they don't care about being fair. They want to hurt th that person because that's part of the point. Uh, now. I don't, the thing is, I don't know what to do next after that point. What do you do? So my solution has always been, we need to create art. We need to create stories. We need to speak to people through, not through like, oh, uh, cerebral, uh, let's talk about, uh, I don't know, uh, marginal tax rates. Let's talk about how a 2% marginal tax rate will fix all these. No, no one, no one cares. Tell a story, right? Write a manga that expresses your beliefs. Speak to the generation that we lost. Uh now, let's, 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 let, let's let H.P. Lovecraft talk before I respond more. This is the attitude we must destroy. Fairness and principle expose the other side. Expose them to who? Themselves? They know. To their enemies? We know. The liberalism of the center-right will always lose because it will always give aid to its enemies. So the reason I'm reading this and the reason I'm interested in this is zero H.P. Lovecraft seems to be a postmodern uh, right, a postmodern right thinker, right? So I've been thinking about this where we mostly talk about postmodernism in relation to the left and moral relativism, but postmodernism isn't necessarily the same thing as being on the left. And one of the things I'm concerned about is if if the right becomes postmodern, will we will we really fix the problem? Will we lose who we are if, if we believe in truth and we abandon the belief in truth to, to defeat our enemies? Will we lose sight of who we are and will we become the the thing we hate right and this is like a really classic theme in literature but on the other hand i don't want to be a gentleman to people who hate me if someone calls me a nazi i don't want to say oh well uh come let's have a little argument about this you know you'll give your case for why i'm a nazi and i'll give my case for why i'm not a nazi i'll be very very polite to you while you call me nazi 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 no 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 absolutely not you can't i cannot stomach the idea of having a polite and gentlemanly debate with someone who is insisting on being a nasty son of a bitch, <laughs> nasty son of a bitch, right? Uh, if you're going to be a nasty son of a bitch to me, I can't reason with you. You need to have some virtue. You need to have some decency in order for us to come together and use logic and reason to have this conversation. So I actually kind of agree with the dissident rights argument that the traditional classical liberal right 
doesn't know how to argue with the left because they think the left wants to argue. The, the left wants to, the new blue checkmark left wants to have power over you. And if arguing is a way for them to get more power, they'll argue. If ignoring arguments and just calling you a cartoon abby, I think it's really interesting how a lot of the thoughtful people on the new right have these, uh, you know, like anonymous avatars, right? Uh, like uh, the Ben Shapiro's of the world. The problem is Ben Shapiro is always thinking about how we can get a section on Fox News, right? That kind of limits that limits what Ben Shapiro can say, and he knows it. I, I think that's why there's a lot of dissatisfaction with uh, blue check mark uh, cons conservative political action committee conservatism. Is you they they are afraid of the left and. Uh, they, they want to be respected and they want to have good careers. So anonymity is kind of a way for someone to like lay it out what they think without fear of reprisal. Uh, there is no neutral majority. There is no neutral, there is no one neutral at all. Just waiting to see if maybe the right catches them in one more lie. Then finally this time they will notice that the leftists are actually evil lizard people. Okay, here's an area where I think I might slightly disagree with zero HP Lovecraft. He's like, like the basic problem is are people bad because they're idiots and they don't know or are people bad because they know exactly what they do they're doing they know they're evil they know they're liars they know they're hypocrites and they don't care they because they want something so much that they're willing to be evil sons of bitches to get it and uh, here like I I believe that intellectual postmodern leftists I think intellectual postmodern leftists know that they are full of shit when they try to sell when they try to sell you a load of bullshit I, I think and I think they're badly intentioned and I think that comes across when they tweet about you know like the Covington Catholic kids they let the mass slip and they let their hatred uh, show through at the same time I do think there's a lot of like idiots like people who just don't care about philosophy they get all of their ideas through Star Wars and Harry Potter right and so they literally I think they literally just don't know what the hell is going on in the world around them because they just can't wait to consume the next pro pro product. Now maybe Zero HP Lovecraft doesn't agree with me, but like to that kind of person, the person who's just like oblivious to what's going on, like oh, oh gee, uh, oh gee, like uh, do, do they have? Uh, do they... I'm trying to think of a, an example, like people who don't know who the president and vice president is, right? So there's an ignorance problem where there's a lot of people who are just like completely oblivious to what the hell is going on, and maybe if you got them to think about what they were advocating. They would see a contradiction and they would want to resolve that contradiction. But basically a lot of people get settled into their worldviews. And once they get settled into their worldviews, you don't, uh, it basically takes like an earth shattering revelation to shake someone out of a deeply entrenched and ingrained worldview. So we're in trouble, right? You can't just logic a uh, consumer into opposing the postmodern, the the postmodern left, like they're they're comfortable where they are. It's it's not easy to get them to change their perspective or red red pill them, if you will. So uh, I'm not sure I dis I, I agree with zero HP Lovecraft that uh, the, the, there's no neutral majority. But I think I, I understand what he's saying is that there's a lot of people who know what they think. They uh, they understand what's going on, and so when they are being irrational assholes and advancing a flagrant double, double standard, they know that they are being assholes and being unfair and hating on white, white people and they're gaslighting you. Like I, I had a conversation with someone who said, oh, there's, there's absolutely no anti-white hatred in the modern left. All we're trying to do is uh, heal racial divides and eliminate uh, racist ideologies. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You you know what I'm talking about. Come on, dude. All right. That, that's not zero HP Lovecraft, by the way. I'm thinking of someone entirely else. All right. Continuing with uh, zero HP Lovecraft, the importance of the right is found in our inability to process in a the impotence, not importance, the impotence of the right is found in our inability to process and adapt to new paradigms. All right, so I'm thinking about art and I agree with this. So let me make a connection of this to art. So the the number one example I think of is the PragerU video on modern art and why is modern art so bad. And the thing is, most normal people, when you show them modern art and postmodern art, they hate it, even if they can't tell you the difference or what, what it is or why it exists. Even a lot of people on the left hate postmodern art 
even if it was made by someone who agrees with them politically, it just doesn't speak to normal people. But my problem with the PragerU rejection of modern art is they basically rely on you loving beauty. They rely on you loving uh, pre-modern art, right? So they'll point at the Mona Lisa and say, look, the Mona Lisa is beautiful. This is a wonderful painting. It makes me feel wonderful. Look at this crappy postmodern urinal in an art gallery. That's so stupid. And the problem with that kind of argument is it works if someone loves beauty, but what if someone hates beauty? And well, uh, you, uh, you, can't, you can't use modernism basically to fight with someone who's a postmodernist because a postmodernist who's thoughtful is someone who thought about modernism and said no I, I don't buy that bullshit modernism I'm gonna take this uh, new stuff postmodernism that sounds great so once they've done that the tools of modernism don't work anymore logic classical liberalism uh, tolerance open-mindedness uh, the postmodernist doesn't care that they've moved beyond all of the good old classical liberal arguments. Uh, Sargon of Akkad. Sargon of Akkad had this problem when he was fighting with uh, Richard Spencer. So Sargon of Akkad would quote John Locke to illustrate kind of, you know, classical liberal thought on politics, and Richard Spencer doesn't care what John Locke thinks because Richard Spencer rejects John Locke. Qu quoting John Locke doesn't mean anything to a Richard Spencer type. And, oh, crud. Right. So th basically my summary would be I I don't like postmodern art on a personal level, but I respect it. Like most conservatives, they hate postmodern and modern art, and they don't respect postmodern and modern artists. I dislike modern and postmodern art, but I deeply respect modern and postmodern artists because they had immense success, right? Like if their art is so bad, why are they so successful? And why are we talented painters sitting on the outside? Look, look, looking in. It's because we let them conquer the culture. We let them conquer the academies. We let them conquer the museums. And now they forced us out and they're, ex and they're exerting their power over us. And they're really, really good at that. Like I can admire if someone I disagree with is kicking my ass. I, I have to be able to admit that. Uh, let's continue with zero HP. Uh, in a way, this is obvious. We are defined by our desire for enduring ways of life, but it still requires dyna uh, dynamicism to preserve ancient sanctity uh, against novel threats. This is really good. So if you believe in something traditional, something new and exciting is dangerous and new and it's hard to understand, but uh, in order to defend the classical things you love, you have to be able to adapt to the new threat. I agree. Until recently, there were many intelligent thinkers on the left, and we weaken ourselves when we fail to integrate their correct insights into our worldview. We do not have to accept their desired ends in order to learn from uh, their social construction. All right, so here's where he's basically making a pitch that we can't throw out the baby with the bat the bathwater. If we agree that uh, postmodernism and moral relativism are bad, we can't just chuck it all out and ignore what the postmodernists are doing. We have to see if there's anything true within postmodernism and integrate that into our response to postmodernism. And my concern is, like, are we going to become moral relativists? Are we going to abandon uh, tr truth entirely? Like, like, what's the what's the limiting principle? Like, where uh, yeah, am I going to lose my love of truth? And am I going to lose all that makes me me? just in order to fight the postmodern the postmodern left. Let's keep reading. Uh, oh, he links to his own, uh, uh, another thread he's done, by, by the way, on uh, kind of like the taking what we need to take out of the postmodern left. Postmodern thought is not a decadent irrationality, nor is it some wicked assault on truth and justice. It is an inevitable series of true realizations in the wake of techno-industrial expansion. The left has adapted to these truths the right has run from them. Technology has decentered man from his understanding of nature. We only ever understand the world through metaphors, and technology provides metaphors that let even dim-witted people perceive the limits of knowledge. So what I, what I take this to mean is that, like, the brave new world of technology, you know, it's robbed us of our ability to go out into nature and, you know, farm for ourselves. We are now dependent on the new capitalist uh, technology to stay alive, basically. The classic and wrong conservative approach to these topics is feeble hand-wringing over moral relativism. The belief that one's own morality must be cosmically absolute derives from a lack of moral and epistemic imagination. So I responded to this bit. I asked, 
do you believe that modern conservatives or classical liberals have to accept moral relativism as a prerequisite to opposing the postmodern left, or only that they underestimate the power of postmodernism and the, inabil uh, the inability to uh, appeal to truth, uh, for, for appealing to truth, to work on the postmodern left? And Zero HP Lovecraft responded to me, I think if you fixate on an idea of global absolute right and wrong, you have already lost an internal battle. I am not telling anyone to throw away their moral, moral beliefs. I am saying they will be much more effective if they neglect the question of scoping morality entirely. So, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft is basically making a pragmatic argument to me here. I'm concerned that if I throw out the idea of absolute truth and universal morality, that uh, I'm going to become the thing I hate, which is just like a uh, by any means necessary, there is no truth, there is no truth, but my truth type, type of person. Like, a, like, like moral relativism to me is morally disgusting. I, I can't live as a moral relativist. And Zero HP Lovecraft is saying, well, I'm not asking you to become a moral relativist. I'm asking you to be more effective by de-emphasizing the importance of universal truth. And that's tricky because you've kind of heard me say that if someone rejects reason, I can't use reason to uh, c convince them of that. If someone objects the if someone rejects the idea of deep eternal truths, I can't appeal to deep eternal truths to convince someone who rejects deep eternal truths that they're deep etern eternal truths. It's, it's kind of like the problem Socrates had with the sophists, where they they would say, "Well, uh, justice is the powerful person. Yeah, the, the the person who's stronger that he has justice, or uh, maybe injustice is better than justice." And Socrates really didn't try to argue with them that much. He kind of showed that you know you're a hypocrite. You don't really. Th you, don't, you can't really think that consistently, but there really isn't a good argument to someone who is so far gone that they actually prefer injustice to justice, because in order to argue in favor of justice, you need to love, you need to love justice, right? Like, if we don't love justice, why, are we, uh, why bother to argue about what justice is and how to, and how to achieve it, right? So modern, postmodern leftism is kind of like a re return to this sort of anarchy of uh, the sophists in Soc Socrates' day. Maybe there is no justice whatsoever. Maybe there is no truth whatsoever. Let's continue reading uh, Zero HP Lovecraft's uh, thread. If there is hope for traditional beliefs in the future, it will only be inside a framework of relativism and uncertainty. This is its best hope in the disenchant disenchanted scientific world, because even if science is fake and gay, technology isn't. So. Because science is gradually being taken over by the postmodern left, uh, it's losing its ability to kind of like do what the scientific method is supposed to do. This, I would say the scientific method was largely developed by Christians who loved God and wanted to learn about God by learning about God's world. So their Christian, uh, their Christian convictions basically motivated them to enter into the natural world and study the natural world and develop the scientific the scientific method. Uh, Lovecraft is suggesting that uh, we, if Christianity continues to exist, we're going to exist in this sort of relativistic, uncertain world. There's no going back to a kind of Christian unity ever again. Uh, I don't think there's ever going to, like, there's no way there's going to be like an undoing of the schism between the Roman Catholics and the, Pro the Protestant Church. There's no, there's no way to undo the schism between the Eastern Orthodox uh, churches and the Roman Ca Catholic Church. So yeah, there's never going to be like this sort of Unitarian, uh, monolithic Christianity ever again in the, wor in the world, I think. I think I would agree with that. Uh, maybe there, there might be a resurgence of uh, Christian belief amongst, you know, common people. There are often, you know, from time to time, religious revivals. Uh, I think the popularity of the postmodern left is sort of a proof that human beings are religious people. We love having a religion. So when the modernists uh, kind of suggested, you know, rational skeptic humanism as uh, the, the new normal, that was quickly dis displaced by a sort of more postmodern religious, religious set of convictions. A lot of people who, you know, are out in the streets tearing down statues, they have this belief in something bigger than themselves. And, and I do agree with the parallels between that and uh, religious belief. They have like a concept of original sin, white privilege is original sin. They have a concept of heaven, a socialist utopia is the heaven on earth that 
they uh, dream of aspiring to uh, reach. You know, there's a kind of penance, you know, a self-flagellation uh, where you admit your complicity in the systems of oppression and you work to be a, a, be a better ally. So I don't think that, like, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft is saying there's, he's, he's suspicious that uh, Christianity and religious and traditional beliefs may die out, but if they exist, he thinks they're going to exist in a relativistic context framework. I'm not so sure, you know, I don't, because I don't know the future. <laughs> maybe that's what will happen. Maybe it'll, maybe there will be something more like a Christian uh, kind of revival or successful pushback. I don't know the future. I, I'm, I'm worried that, because I do accept that this is a real possibility for the future, but I don't know. Uh, what's difficult to understand about the current moment is that although we per perceive a great and terrible power, it's not clear who is wielding that power. It seems to come from everywhere and nowhere. So this is alluding back to what I was talking about with the four uh, creative books. All of them are talking about this evil, overbearing, corrupting power that invades in our lives. But where does it come from? Who wields it? Who has the power? The postmodern theory of knowledge intersects with the ascension of woke power in the thought of Michael Foucault the number one most cited researcher according to Google Scholar. We will see why this is important. Okay, postmodern theory of knowledge, how do you know what you know, and the ascension of woke power. So how do you know what you know is a really important thing for you know the, the typical SJW on, on Twitter trying to assert their power over you and cancel you and ruin your life. Uh, Foucault taught that power does not adhere in individuals, but in networks of people, that it is manifest between everyone and everyone else at all times, that it cannot be possessed, only enacted, and that it coerces by manufacturing truth. All right. So you as an individual don't have power. The social, you know, the social people around us, the institutions, uh, the, 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 teeming masses uh, screaming for blood in the streets, the power structures in the Catholic Church, all of this powerful stuff works together to create an idea of truth. And then the idea of truth shapes who you are as an individual, right? So there's kind of the postmodern aspect of it. And uh, I don't know if Foucault would say this is good or bad. He's just trying to describe uh, how it works. Truth is a thing of this world. It is produced by constraint. Each society has its regime of truth, the types of discourse it accepts, the mechanisms which enable one to distinguish true and false statements, the means by which each is sanctioned. Power is induced by truth, in quotes, which is contingent and socially constructed. This makes conservatives bristle because they rightly know there is an immutable reality. There's gravity. If I jump off the building and say I can fly, gravity will, put, will pull me down. There is an objective reality, but whoops, I did it again, but they refuse to understand how much flexion their own minds have with regard to the absolute. So because conservatives emphasize objective truth, they underestimate the degree to which an individual is shaped by these sort of powerful cultural forces uh, around them, which define truth for them. The dissident right breaks from the mainstream right precisely when it realizes, along with Foucault, that truth is not the privilege of those who have liberated themselves. So actually some of this, like the fact that I have such a cursory knowledge of Foucault is limiting my ability to grasp this, but I can, but I can see examples of this. 4chan is the dissident right. 4chan uh, has stopped caring about like having arguments and it just makes fun of you know, blue check marks with shit posts, right? They're, they're not trying to have an argument. They are trying to have some fun and laugh as the world collapses uh, around us. And it's really interesting that uh, for, you can really talk about how 4chan has a postmodern sense of humor, but they're clearly on the right. Uh, Mulberg's famous dictum is the sovereign determines the null hypothesis. So I, I actually agree that, yeah, this is where the new right is breaking with like the old classically liberal right, but I'm not so sure I agree with if that's the way it we should be going. Like, I, like there's a pragmatic argument here that in order to fight the postmodern left, you have to understand the postmodern left, and I agree with that 100%. But that doesn't necessarily make it true that uh, we should abandon uh, you know, concepts like fair play or concepts like 
ultimate truth entirely. I, I think that would be dangerous. Maybe, maybe an alternate argument would be like a lot of people are hungry for an idea of truth. They're sick of the postmodern left, and maybe something like Christianity offers a framework for them that was being filled by the woke re religious religious left. Right? Like you can't just uh, you can't just tear down the postmodern left. You have to give someone something to believe in that gives them a sense of hope, or they'll just naturally stay inclined to whatever they were in in the the first place. So, I guess I agree with like the pragmatic argument that uh, appeals to. Uh, truth and individualism are ineffective against the postmodern left. I'm just not sure. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm willing to go as far as saying. Therefore, I am a po postmodernist. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Molberg also identifies the distributed nature of sovereignty, and he gives the name cathedral to the decentralized conspiracy. The cathedral is not any specific people. It is a network of power relations defined by incentive gradients and sustained by our institutions. So, uh, zero HP. I love you. you you're very thoughtful. Uh, help a dummy out, or you know, give give me something to read to kind of track track with you here. What what I understand you to mean is like the cathedral. So, what's a cathedral? It's a big giant structure of the Catholic Church. It's kind of a symbol of power of the Catholic Church. Uh, it makes it so that you can't attack you can't attack the whole institution because the institution is so big and there are so many pieces of it so you could say like whoa well i dislike uh, i dislike the selling of indulgences in the catholic church and someone might nod and agree with you but they love other parts of the catholic church so that's it's not enough even if you're right about one part of the argument the bigness and the grandeur of the cathedral makes it so that you can't just burn burn it all down you attack one piece of it but all the other pieces of it uh, help. That's kind of like how I'm contextualizing this. Uh, even so, I suggest you avoid fixing, fixating on the cathedral. It soon becomes an embarrassing mental prison, a fully general scapegoat that clouds what is intended to clarify. There is no truth that can be rescued from power. The cathedralite has no power of her own, but she is able to exercise power on behalf of the cathedral by acting according to its truth. If you're within the Catholic Church, you have to accept you at least have to accept some Catholic doc doctrine. Maybe you can be a bit, little bit of a rebel, but they won't let you be too much of a re rebel. If you want to be within, like, the woke New York Times, maybe you can uh, make a little point about, gee, I, I don't know about a Marxist revolution, guys, but they will eventually kind of force you back in line with uh, what the rest of them are thinking, what the group think. Anyone, no matter how lowly, is able to wield Foucauldian power to control others as long as they act in accordance with power's truth. So you see that in people canceling each other. I am gay and white, and you are being homophobic. Oh, yeah? Well, I am black, and you are being racist. Oh, no! <laughs> Who wins? Right? They're always doing this to each other. Uh, knowledge constrains action. Foucauldian power operates by means of knowledge. The sovereign sets the null hypothesis. Cathedral power justifies itself thus. There is no evidence that my truth isn't true. And he gives like four headline examples of this. The FBI finds no intel indicating Antifa involvement in Sunday's violence. Uh, what's this one? CNN, was there widespread voter fraud by illegal immigrants in California? There is no evidence that there was widespread voter fraud by illegal Im immigrants or anyone else in California. Scientists, exactly zero evidence COVID-19 came from a lab. lab. There's no evidence that protests have caused a coronavirus surge, right? Like, you prove the point by asserting that there's no evidence ag against your point, and then you just continue to assume it's true. Okay, that's a really good illustration. Th this is much better. Like, some of your points, uh, zero HP Lovecraft, I'm having a hard time following. This one, you give me, like, a really concrete example I can connect with that helps me understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, power is decentralized. If a single node is in the knowledge power nexus flips, the cathedral treats it as damage and roots around it. If a Harvard dean or New York Times editor goes rogue, they get ignore, ignored or ejected. Right, so you talk about morons on campus canceling conservative speakers, and you show them video, and they say, oh, well, you know, okay, okay, I, I, I guess. Oh, the oh, kids these days are being a little not. But that's not proof of some uh, massive SJW problem. No, 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 no. Right, so as long as you can... You can ignore individual facts that would give you a problem, right? That would challenge your beliefs. So long as you have like a bigger 
I don't know, like a bigger world of ideas that you just sort of naturally, uh, naturally believe in, right? You can just trust in the whole structure and the system, even if like little individual things give you problems. Everyone knows more or less what power expressed through truth demands. We can sense it. We know the magic words we can say to give orders to others. That makes me uncomfortable. That's hateful. That could offend some people. The words sound innocent, but they aren't. aren't. If you challenge a person who is enacting power, they can escalate. Your nearest authority knows the truth and will side with power. If he doesn't, his superior will, or his, and so on. In rare cases, these things go to court, where truth is constituted as law and precedent. Usually, your little rebellions won't get that far, because your social group, acting in concert, will reject or correct you. No one needs to tell them what to do. The algorithm, everyone move towards your neighbor, creates emergent patterns called flocking. So even if you resist cancel culture a little bit, uh, everyone else kind of like nudges you in the direction. So this I would see as having like a strong like evolutionary biology perspective on it where a lot of animals show herd mentality. Let's stick with the herd. If the cows are going that way, let's follow them. I don't know if this is scientifically accurate or not, but, you know, like lemmings will jump off a cliff because they're following the other lemmings and they don't know what's ahead of them, right? Uh, and so he's saying that this is true of human beings as well. We're a social creature. Uh, what everybody else thinks will force you into one direction eventually. Even if you start spiraling off in a direction that's away from the group, they, they nudge you back in line. Truth is manufactured by academia and disseminated through media. So with this, like, I'm all about, like, the arts disseminating I ideas. And I think it is true that, like, especially for bad artists, they get their marching orders. Who will I vote for in the next election? What's the woke idea of the day? And then they take that idea and say, I will make art which expresses the things I already believe. I think, like, this, like, really bad Christian art follows this pattern, and really bad SGW art follows this pattern. The, art, the artist gets their marching orders and then they uh, make art which expresses the ideas they've been taught, uh, they've been told they have to express. I think really good artists have maybe a bit more of like a muse. They, they have an explosion of ideas they qu can't even quite explain and the world they create, uh, the story they create, the art they create is bigger than themselves. So I would say in that instance uh, they, they, would, they would disrupt this pattern. So if a bad artist the truth is manufactured by academia and disseminated through media. The good artist says, "No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the damn art, damn it!" And then maybe, maybe the academics have to like ca play catch up with them. But I, I do think there is truth to the idea that the big ideas start in the academy and they trickle down through uh, to the normal people through the arts. The arts are how the ideas get out there. Postmodernism doesn't really affect anybody until. Uh, comic books start expressing postmodern ideas for for normies what once once normies start getting instructed in postmodernism once they start making children's books about uh, transgender issues that's when the rubber hits the road and the normal you know like hobbit people who weren't caring about it originally suddenly it becomes a real life problem for them oh my son is being taught that he should be transgender because he's a he's a little because he, he likes my, my little pony or something right and then maybe the question is is it too late what are we already screwed by the time it gets to the point where normal people notice the problem uh, citation is the mechanism that is used to manufacture truth their science is not empirical it is prescriptive once a decree is published it can be cited and becomes evidence and he cites to uh, Bennett's Demelik or JC Bon Thetel. What is with these weird usernames? But uh, talking about how scientific studies can kind of like cite other scientific studies, right? I, I'm not going to get into that right now. So you, there, there are plenty of threads you could go follow for more information. Power knowledge is not broken by simply pushing back against it. In many cases, resistance can reify it, as many in the sphere have noted. This is because facts are only loosely correlated with knowledge. Uh, Le Wick on the, the Wikipedia on power knowledge contains a synecdoche of this. Uh, this, like, so he po posts a Wikipedia article that says, a recent study shows, for example, the commercial implications of Google Images algorithm, as all search results for the term beauty in different languages predominantly yield results of white young women. And then you search beauty, and you get some white young women, but you also get some uh, black young women, and some uh, hijabi-wearing young women, right? So... The implication of that is that Google heard about this, they got embarrassed about it, that they adjusted their algorithm to get some uh, people people of color 
in their algorithm when you search beauty. I'm not really, I'm not 100% sure what the connection is, zero HP between what you're showing here and the power, the power now. This is another thing where the philosophy you're talking is going over my head, but I, I do kind of see how, I, I guess the connection is that Google believe, people believe that if you Google beauty and all you see is white women, that's white power privilege. That's the, that's the white cis heteronormative patriarchy being uh, sup supported by Google. So when Google deliberately changes the algorithm results so that some people of color show up, that's Google basically caving and saying, oh crap, we can't, we don't want that, on, uh, we don't want to be accused of being racist, so we're going to adjust what we do, we're going to adjust the facts to sort of fix the problem and not make it so embarrassing for us. Facebook, when Facebook labels conservative sites fake news, that's Facebook trying to avoid the problem of getting labeled as right wing by, by the press. They're embarrassed, they want to pre be perceived as good little progressives, so they fix the algorithms to promote what they want to promote. Power is the source of social discipline and conformity. To challenge power is not a matter of seeking some absolute truth, but of it, it detaching the power of truth from the forms of social, economic, and cultural hegemony within which it operates. So here we're getting a bit more like to the meat of the matter. If you want to fight like the evil lizard overlords of Google and Facebook, you have to move beyond a commitment to absolute truth. Uh, to detaching the power of truth from the forms of social, economic, and cultural he hegemony. So I'm guessing he means think like a postmodernist and use that as a way of resisting or fighting the pow powerful woke cultural po forces that are trying to uh, impo impose upon you. Now, I guess, what does that look like? Like, what specific, what, what specific kinds of things do you do? What do you get to talk about? Can you still talk about absolute truth? If you want to, or do you can you can you only talk in sort of like a postmodern uh, tete a tete? You undermine me this way, fine. I undermine you that way. I, I, I'm curious. Like, uh, I think the new dissident right is still emerging, and a lot of this is still up in the air. I don't know what the dissident right politics looks like like quite yet, really. I just hear examples of things they say that maybe I hear a good point there. I hear a good point here, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what the dissident rights end game is or what the world they're shooting for looks like. In some ways, Foucault's ideas are quite reactionary and he drew criticism from his leftist colleagues because his ideas, taken to their logical conclusion, undermine the idea that any kind of emancipation is even possible. This is undeniably true, says Zero HP Lovecraft. We can never escape from society affecting the way we think. I, I agree. You're, you're always There's always going to be peer pressure. If you are a Christian and uh, the world is not Christian, there's always going to be a pressure for you to uh, conform to the world. If you are on the right and there's this constant pressure to move left, there's even if you try to stay your best to stay true to your beliefs, the, the world itself is going to force you in some ways to compromise or even if it's just like to protect your family, <clears throat> right? Like there are things you might not be willing to compromise on, but if they're going to fire you and uh, you're going to starve to death and not be able to feed your family, you're going to make some compromises to do that. Foucault recognized that humanitarianism is a form of totalitarian control and that sincere concerns for rights and justice are inadequate for ch challenging power. If we ever want to reclaim power, we must create truth that is discontinuous with humanitarianism. That's another thing where I don't know what the implications of that uh, would be. And there's my response in Zero HP Lovecraft responding to me. So I do believe that the dissident right is a rising, I don't even know if it's a problem really, because because I agree with basically the criticism of the uh, trad, you know, conservative ink, right? They're so stupid. They, they let the culture go. They let all the institutions go. I think there's something healthy about maybe a postmodern right challenging that and kind of like forcing the conservative boomers to rethink like like we have to rethink what what worked in the Reagan era doesn't work anymore what worked for National Review and the Weekly Standard during the Bush years does not work anymore they lost uh, Trump uh, Trump didn't defeat the uh, the never Trump right the never Trump right lost already before Trump wrote uh, came to power. And when Trump came to power, that was a symbol of something new happening on the right that was completely different than the, con the conservative Reagan right uh, before that. I guess my issue of departure with uh, Zero HP Lovecraft is I don't think that dissatisfaction with 
uh, the classically liberal right is the same as saying, therefore, I, I'm dissatisfied with the classically liberal uh, right, therefore, I must become a postmodernist. That's, that's where I guess I depart from zero HP Lovecraft. He, he seems to think that in order to effectively fight the postmodern left, we must completely uh, we must completely enter into the perspective of the post postmodern left, learn what is true within postmodernism, and then apply that in our situation and construct our own personal truth in opposition uh, to theirs. Uh, now, based on what he said to me, that he, uh, I the, the thing is, I actually don't know. Uh, do, do, zero HP Lovecraft. Do you believe that there are ultimate truths, or do you believe that it's ultimately? Uh, relative and like how does that relate to you've you've said rightly that there is a there is a real objective world you jump off a building the gravity is going to pull you down that's like an objective fact do you believe that extends to philosophy like is all philosophy subjective or are there objective truths within uh philosophy basic where where am I at? Basically, I'm at the point where I think the dissident postmodern right have raised a valid criticism against the classically liberal uh, boomer right, but I'm I'm not willing to become a postmodernist yet because I think the danger of that is in become, becoming what I hate. If what I hate is moral relativism, I don't want to be a moral relativist. At the same time, uh, pragmatism. There's there's wisdom to pragmatism. Jesus said this. Jesus said, "Be innocent as doves and shrewd as snakes." And there's two parts to that. Be innocent as doves. Don't sin. Don't do what's wrong. Don't become uh, don't become evil. Right. But be shrewd as snakes. Like don't be an idiot. Don't just like uh, la di da la di da. Oh, you guys think I'm Nazis? I'll come have a nice conversation with you la di da, and then they destroy you. Right. Like that's stupid. It's it's stupid to let them destroy you because you think. Uh, they're na it's naive. It's naive for you as a nice person to think that everybody else is nice and they want truth and they're going to be nice to you and respect you if you just are nice to them and respect them. No, no, bullies exist and they're nasty. And uh, I think there's a rightness to if someone's at war with you, defend defending yourself. Uh, if if they cancel you, I don't like cancel culture, but if they're going to cancel us, we have to cancel some of them to teach them that we're not going to let you get away with this. If they sell fake news uh, to... Okay, so maybe this would be an application of it. If they sell fake news to us, one track is we are going to prove the fake news is wrong. We're going to prove what's true, right? And so I guess in the Zero HP Lovecraft framework, that's not enough. So would, should we make right-wing fake news to counter left-wing fake, fake news? Basically, like if, if we could prove that making this right wing fake news would help us win an election, would it be good to make some right wing fake news? And I'm not sure I'm willing to, to go that far. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to go as far as saying we can't we can't rely on outdated, you know, gentlemanly, classically liberal arguments and behaviors and patterns of thought to oppose people who are fighting a war with us, have been fighting a war with us, and are constantly lying to us as they're, as they're fight, fighting the war with us. So I guess I'm kind of a divided mind. I, I don't know what the future holds. Uh, I know what I believe, and it was nice to hear someone who I disagree with express a point that I think is a really, really, really good point. So I'll be following Zero HP Lovecraft. I'll tweet this at you if you listen to this. Thanks for taking the time to hear me uh, splur splurge out my thoughts, and th thank you for a very thoughtful uh, perspective. So with that, I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Catch you later.